And now for this morning's encouragement, I invite Reverend Michael to come to the podium. And in his own inimitable style, I'm sure he will urge us to change our thinking, change our life, to turn the other cheek. Reverend Michael. <laughs> Thank you, Carol. Good morning, friends. I bid good morning to you here in the Temple of Light, Center for Spiritual Living in Kingston, Jamaica, and to you listening to me online. This is one of the many beautiful days the Lord has made, and we give thanks, and we are glad in it. My talk is on forgiveness. And you can spell that title with an O-N for two words, on forgiveness, or a U-N for one word, as you wish. They will both amount to the same thing, forgiveness. If, as the Bible says, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, which is to say more prosaically that we all fail at times to live up to our highest self and ideals. If we don't keep on forgiving one another, we'll all be walking around in a state of unforgiveness. Each one of us would have relatives, friends, and acquaintances to forgive. A whole lot of people, especially for those who have lots of relatives. And each one of us would as well need forgiveness from those relatives, friends, and acquaintances. That would be a very unhappy world indeed. No doubt it was because Jesus realized this, that when Peter asked him, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus replied, not seven times, but 70 times seven. He meant continually, every time forgiveness was asked for. Most, if not all of you, know that the main reason you should forgive is not to make the forgivee happy. It is to prevent you, the forgiver, from being unhappy. You have heard often enough that being unforgiving is like holding a hot coal in your hand in order to burn the other person. Even if you don't really want to give the other per person who has wronged you the relief of your forgiveness, you should forgive him or her for the purely selfish reason that it will make you feel better. Dash where the hot coal man, as we say in Jamaica. Some of you might think that some men and women are just too wicked to forgive. For example, those who have scammed old people of their last savings, leaving them penniless and suicidal. It happens. And you might not want to forgive rapists and abusers of children and murderers. People, I mean, who have committed some really awful crimes. Perhaps premeditated at that. They don't deserve forgiveness, surely. They should be locked up in prison and the key thrown away. Now suppose any of those criminals, I mean people who have been commit, uh, convicted of crime, tried to come to this church 
What should the leadership do, do you think? Tell them to go away? And if instead we told them, come on in, you're welcome, what would you do? Shun them? Change your seat if they sat beside you? What would Jesus do? The Bible relates that when the scribes and the Pharisees saw Jesus sharing a meal with sinners, and get this, tax collectors, they asked Jesus' disciples, how come? Jesus heard the question and gave a very reasonable explanation. I quote, they that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. To repentance. Unquote, I love the logic. After Jesus told Peter he should forgive his brother 70 times seven, he elaborated on this advice with this cautionary parable. I quote from the Bible. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all the debts of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servants just as I had on you? In anger, the master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. Jesus ended with this warning. I quote, this is how my heavenly Father will treat you, each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. We should, of course, take that warning in the context of the hot coal in your hand concept. Not that God in heaven would punish you, but that God in your heart, your own feelings, would torment you. Many might ask, how can I forgive when I can't forget? Good question. Here's the answer. You really forgive when you learn to perceive the wrong that was done to you, not as a wrong at all, but as a learning opportunity. You replace anger and disappointment with a feeling of gratitude for the wrong. That's in quotes. That makes it, sub that makes it suddenly no longer a wrong, 
but a positive event that leads you to new insights about yourself and your life. It could even lead you to a higher level of consciousness and more love for God and your neighbor. Remember Jesus' first and second commandments, love God with your whole your heart, your mind, etc., etc. That's the first commandment, and love your neighbor as yourself, the second. In case you're wondering why I mentioned, <coughs> mentioned ex-prisoners coming to this church, remember that Reverend Anne and Carol Charlton go weekly to the women's prison where they teach women who were found guilty of some very bad crimes. And Reverend John and I go to the Tower Street Correctional Institution also known as GP, General Penitentiary, where the men we teach were all convicted of major crimes, those mentioned earlier, and more. We invite them to come to the Temple of Light when they leave prison. One or two did come. They might return. You don't know what's in the heart of the person sitting beside you, in church, on the bus, or in the boardroom. The inmates we teach in prison all seem absolutely normal. No, I take that back. The students in all the general penitentiary classes that we have been conducted for many years give absolutely no trouble. Unlike so many students in classes in the outside world, you know from the news reports that many give no ends of trouble. In fact, some inmates are excellent students, both in behavior and in intelligence. Some went to high school and even university. One who I'll call Saul, is a good-looking brown man in his late 30s, I think, well-spoken, with tertiary education, middle class. He's smart, he picks up concepts easily, and he's very friendly. What pleases Reverend John and me most, however, is his helpfulness. He organizes the 18 to 20 men in the current cohort so that they come to class, and this might involve a certain amount of paperwork. He arranges the seats in the schoolroom. He gets markers and dusters, well, sometimes not a duster, but a wet rag. That was what happened on Tuesday, wet rag. And last week, he got a whiteboard cleaning liquid to clean the board for me, which I needed to use the board. He helps out fellow inmates who can't read the handouts that we give them. Yes, we do also get people who can't read, as along with the, the high school and university students. On Tuesday, when I saw how helpful Saul was, I called him a good organizer, as talking to Reverend John. Reverend John called him a good leader. From the way he dresses, he seems to have some money, and he lives, or at least lived, above halfway tree. Sounds like the sort of man who many women would love to, has a ha to have as a boyfriend or husband, maybe even the father of their children, right? except that he's in prison for murdering his girlfriend, his pregnant girlfriend. That was shocking, I know. But please keep your thoughts calm. Forget Saul for a moment and focus on the lovely tune that I'm going to ask Maestro Dexter to play. Noel, three verses of new every morning is thy love, please.
That was quite delightful. Thank you very much. I hope we've calmed down after that anecdote. Now, what do we, Reverend John and I, do with Saul? We don't shun him. We work with him. Do we forgive him? It's not in our place to forgive him. The courts of law might be able to, but we can only love him in our hearts and try to teach him truth, truth principles. You see, one day, maybe decades from now, considering his crime, he'll probably be back among us in society. And he needs a different consciousness from the one that sent him into prison, hence the truth principles. I called him Saul after the Saul of the New Testament, who was a fierce persecutor of Christians, meaning he probably had many killed. Well, Saul saw the light on the road to Damascus, we know the story, and became St. Paul, the most influential advocate of Christianity ever. The general penitentiary soul appears to have seen the light too. He certainly is helping us spread truth in the general penitentiary. Those in Orthodox Christianity might say that God forgave the persecutor Saul of Tarsus for his past sins and used him for good purposes, spreading the word. And that he may also have forgiven, you may, they may say, he may also have forgiven the general penitentiary soul. That's how Orthodox Christian, Christianity might put it. Religious science doesn't put it that way. We teach that God is the God of now, the present, that God doesn't look back at your past and only reacts moment by moment to your current consciousness, working in accordance with the law of attraction. To quote Ernest Holmes, founder of religious science, God is not a person. God is a presence personified in us, unquote. That presence is mind, universal mind, and your mind is part of it. Your current consciousness, not your past consciousness, attracts things to you right now. So change your thinking, change your life. Which, by the way, is the name of the course that we teach in prison. Orthodox Christianity, as opposed to New Thought, is founded on the belief that God sent his beloved son to die on the cross so that God can forgive us our sins. You may well wonder what's the connection between Jesus dying and God forgiving us. Christian churches talk, up, talk about Jesus as being Agnes Dei, the Lamb of God, who was literally sacrificed for us humans. You probably see the pagan roots. For thousands of years, primitive man sacrificed animals to their gods to gain their favor. And throughout the Bible, in both the Old and New Testaments, we read about animal sacrifices. Because of their culture, the early Christians included Jesus in those sacrifices, hence Agnes Dei. But it is not something that he said about himself. He said he came to give us life, life more abundant. He nowhere says he came to die for our sins so that our sins could be forgiven. It's true that not long before his death, he suspected he was going to be killed, but that's because of the radical things he was preaching. They upset the strict Jews and the Romans. 
they didn't like the thousands of people who were following Jesus around. So in religious science, we don't teach that Jesus died for our sins. It's, it's not scientific. What we teach about forgiveness is in fact what Jesus himself taught in the parable of the prodigal son. Dr. Holmes calls the parable, and I quote, one of the greatest spiritual lessons in the history of religious education. It is an attempt on the part of the great teacher to show us that God turns to us as we turn to him, that there is reciprocal action between the universal and the individual mind, that the spirit is ready to help us whenever we turn to it." Unquote. More specifically, Dr. Holmes says that when the prodigal son goes back to his father and cries, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and I'm no more worthy to be called thy son, the father immediately orders the servants to dress the son properly and provide a feast for the family. Dr. Holmes said that the father did not answer the son when he talked about being a sinner. He spoke about something else. I quote Dr. Holmes, this is one of the most wonderful lessons in the whole story. God, God does not know evil and therefore cannot talk about or conceive it in any form. God does not even hear us when we talk about sin or evil. If he could hear it, he would be conscious of it, and he would not be wholly good." Unquote. While the sermons and songs of many other churches, Christians and otherwise, are full of the words sin and evil. We in religious science try to avoid those words. Our prayers are fundamentally prayers of thanksgiving. In gratitude for God's mercy, for its practice of responding instantly to every fresh state of our consciousness, we say, and I'm giving the words to the tune that Valerie and Noel played earlier. We say, new every morning is thy love. Our waking and uprising prove. Through sleep and darkness safely brought, restored to life and power and thought. New mercies each returning day hover around us while we pray. New perils past, mistakes forgiven, new thoughts of God, new hopes of heaven. Only, O Lord, in thy dear love fit us for perfect rest above and help us this and every day to live more nearly as we pray. Namaste.